Crawford Laureate, Professor Dolph Schluter, President of the Crawford Foundation and members of the Crawford family, dear audience. It is my honor on behalf of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences to present this year's Crawford Laureate in Biosciences. And I wish you all warmly welcome to this 2023 Crawford Prize lecture. My name is Ove Eriksson and I've been chairing the Crawford Prize Committee in the biology class at the Academy. And before I introduce Professor Schluter, uh, I will say a few words about the Crawford Prize. So, uh, <clears throat> the Crawford Foundation was established in 1980 uh, by the great Swedish industrialist Holger Crawford. The main aim of the foundation is to support scientific research and education, and it also supports many other activities, uh, social, cultural and artistic. The Crawford Prize is based on a donation to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences from Anna Greta and Holger Crawford and the Crawford Foundation. And the prize has been awarded since 1982, normally following a four-year cycle mathematics and astronomy, geosciences, biosciences with special emphasis on ecology, that is this year's prize, and polyarthritis. In addition to polyarthritis, which was an illness Holger, Holger Crawford suffered from, the choice of subjects aims at complementing the Nobel Prizes, that is the subjects in natural sciences, which, with the possible exception of astronomy, are not covered by the Nobel Prizes. The procedure for selecting the Crawford Prize laureate is the same as for the Nobel Prizes. The Academy first invites nominations, normally we receive uh, around 100 nominations, and the candidates are carefully evaluated by the prize committee with the help of external experts. And based on these evaluations, the prize committee suggests one awardee. The prize may also sometimes be shared uh, with a maximum of three awardees. And the final decision is made by the Academy. The prize sum is currently 6 million Swedish crowns. Among previous Crawford laureates in biosciences, we find names such as Edward o. Wilson, Robert May, Ernst Meyer, Carl Vuz, Ilke Hansky, Tomoka Otto and Richard Lewentin, and last time, 2019, Sally Chisholm. This year, no, so. Uh, this year, the Crawford Prize is awarded to Dolph Schluter for fundamental contributions to the understanding of adaptive radiation and ecological speciation. Dolph Schluter is currently University Killam Professor in the Zoology Department and Biodiversity Research Center at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada. Schluter graduated in 1983 at the University of Michigan with a thesis on Galapagos finches, or Darwin finches. And I guess it's fair to say that the, his formative years were when he did this field work for that thesis on the Galapagos Islands, supervised and together with Peter and Rosemary Grant. One particularly important result of this early research was when Schluter convincingly demonstrated character displacement, at that time a very controversial concept, Using pairs of species of finches, he showed that when species competed for resources, they were more different than when living alone on other islands. This gave the impetus to and the start of an exceptional career, exploring ecological speciation, that is, when natural selection leads to the evolution of reproductive isolation, a key criterion for species, and how this process in turn may result in rapidly multiplying lineages of species, what we call adaptive radiation. Although these ideas are firmly based on Darwin and his uh, ideas on speciation, decades of research had not clearly demonstrated the occurrence of ecological speciation. Schluter's research 
has been groundbreaking. Much of this has been conducted on the species complex of fish, the three-spined sticklebacks, but he also currently leads research on several other groups of organisms. Schluter's achievements includes a long list of very important and highly influential scientific papers. And his outstanding book, The Ecology of Adaptive Radiation from 2000, has become a standard reference in speciation research. Dolph Schluter has received several prestigious awards before. The Darwin Wallace Medal from the Linnean Society of London. The Darwin Medal, which is another medal, from the Royal Society of London. And in 2021, he received the Order of British Columbia. So, it's for me a great pleasure and honor to welcome Dolph Schluter to present the 2023 Crawford Prize Lecture in Biosciences with the title The Origin of Modern Species. So, please, Dolph. Thanks very much. <coughs> Um, it's very exciting to be here, and uh, I want to thank you for coming, and the Academy, and the Crawford family. We all uh, hope to be recognized for the work that we do, but I feel very fortunate to be recognized in this incredibly special way. Um, I want to give an overview of uh, some of the things that um, I've been working on, and some of the questions that I find most interesting. And I'll start by saying something we already know, and that is that the, the, the diversity of life is breathtaking. And uh, for myself, I can think of nothing more interesting to have happened in the universe since the Big Bang. And we can all appreciate it. It's easily within grasp. We go outside, go for a, a, a walk in the woods, and... Um, you know, just stand there and look at the the diversity, the shapes, the colors, the smells, the s sounds. And after a while, uh, standing there in such a beautiful setting, you begin to feel restored. Um, but then, curious, and so you whip out your phone and start to ask it, wh what am I looking at? What am I seeing in front of me? And the, the answer is, species. So uh, this is a, a photo taken in some woods uh, just east of Vancouver and uh, you can see in this picture some of our common tree species, western red cedar, Douglas fir, western hemlock, also salal and other, and other plants. And um, one of the questions then that comes to mind is wh why are there species? Where do they come from? And part of the answer to that question is why don't they collapse all into a single species? Why, despite being sexually active, do they not all interbreed and result in a messy hybrid form? And the, and the answer is, of course, they don't collapse because they don't interbreed. Or if they do interbreed, they don't produce offspring that are very viable or, or fertile. And that characteristic of uh, species, as uh, Ove mentioned, is called reproductive isolation. R-I, not A-I. So I study how new species form, and the central question then is, how does reproductive isolation evolve? We, we are species our, ourselves. We can recognize um, e each other as belonging to the same species and, and others as belonging to other species. And how does, that, how does that evolve? How did that evolve in our lineage? How does it evolve in, in, in nature so that individuals recognize and prefer to mate with one another rather than with everything around them and everybody around them? So reproductive isolation, which is a terrible phrase, but I'm going to use it anyway because it's the standard in the in the field. It's the characteristic feature of species. It's what um, allows them to maintain their distinctiveness. And the, the evolution of reproductive isolation is what allows different lineages to maintain their evolutionary independence and become 
different and over time very different from one another. And so this is a crucial step in the evolution of all biodiversity. And so it is that this process repeated over and over again through the history of life has produced all of the diversity that we see out there. Another question that interests me is where are all these species now that they've formed? And um, it turns out that they're not evenly distributed around the world, but are concentrated at certain uh, uh, regions and, and latitudes. Um, and uh, some of these patterns are evident on my own bookshelf where I have here the, the slim, compact birds of Europe standing next to the large and heavy birds of Ecuador. To a large approximation, most birds are found in the tropics. And um, I do enjoy... Um, bird watching and, and one of the most fantastic groups of birds out there are the, are the hummingbirds. So they're rather like the sunbirds on this side of the, of the ocean. They're brightly colored, they visit flowers, and they're hugely diverse. And in Canada, we have you know, three or four species, but when I visited uh, Ecuador, I was overwhelmed and bewildered by the number of species that one, one finds there. It's absolutely extraordinary, and, and there are many groups, in fact, most groups of uh, organisms on this planet show such uneven distributions of um, organisms around uh, the world. And I work on, on, on fishes, so here's a, 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 p a pattern, a map of marine fish um, species diversity. So it's a heat map. The, the hotter colors mean identify locations where the numbers of species are um, exceptionally high. And the cold uh, colors, the blue, uh, identify regions um, where the numbers of species is relatively low. And you can see around Scandinavia, where we are now, and around Canada, where I live, it's all blue. But what is the relationship between this uneven distribution of species on the planet and the origin of species? And so I'm showing a second heat map over on the right-hand side of where on Earth new species are forming most rapidly. Today, the shortest interval of time between uh, the splitting of a lineage and the evolution of a new species. Where, where is this happening? And the answer is it's in the coldest regions of the, of the world. On average, it takes about, across the tree of life, the interval of time between a, a, a lineage um, a population forming and evolving reproductive isolation from its relatives takes on average across the tree of life about two million years. But in certain parts of the world, it's happening much faster, and it's surprising that this should be in the temperate zone. And this pattern has now been identified in um, birds and mammals and plants as well. Even though most species are found in the tropics, and it was at one time thought that this can be explained by the fact that new species originate much more rapidly in the tropics, the, uh, the opposite is uh, now recognized to be true. And so uh, if you enjoy species as I do and you like to snorkel and uh, see lots of color diversity, um, go to the tropics. But if you want to be where the action is, come back. Because the lineages of fishes that are multiplying most rapidly are the eel pouts and the, the flat fishes. They're not the brilliantly colored coral reef fishes. They're the ones that you find in, in the seas around here and that many of you have eaten. And um, young is good. And uh, I work on young species because, well, they're still largely in the process of formation and the opportunity then is um, exists to study the process as it's happening before it's absolutely finished. And my first exposure to this problem and question was as a student in the Galapagos. So here's a picture of two of the um, Galapagos ground finches that I worked on. 
As I mentioned, across the tree of life, the average time it takes to form a new species is about two million years, but these two species are separated by only about two to three hundred thousand years, which is um, you know, much, much more rabid than the, than the global average. Um, it, my first trip to the Galapagos, I was uh, 22 years old. I had never been anywhere south. Uh, uh, of, of Canada, and um, I was dropped on this island of Pinta, where I spent the next five months um, out of n no radio uh, contact, um, eating out of cans and drinking out of um, jerry cans that we also had to bring with us because there's no uh, no water on uh, any of the islands. It was it was the adventure of my lifetime, and in the end, I, I spent a total of about two years living in a tent on remote islands, completely out of contact from the rest of civilization. Um, I don't think we're allowed to do this to our students anymore. More recently, I've begun work on three-spine stickleback, and uh, I became interested in them because I was looking for a group in which it would be possible to do experiments, to pursue some of these questions a little further than uh, we've been able to do on the uh, Galapagos and in other uh, systems where one might actually you know, put species together and ask questions like, how's natural selection changed when two species are present in the environment compared to one? So here's an illustration of what the um, what stickleback actually l look like, although they're gigantic in my imagination, they're only about this big. And um, they have many features which make them uh, extremely good for study, including the ability to bring them into the, into the lab and make crosses. So I'm showing you a map of um, southwestern British Columbia. Um, the city of Vancouver is shown there on the map, and it's in small lakes, especially on islands, but along the coast in this region that I, I work on these um, freshwater populations of three-spined stickleback. So they're all derived from the marine three-spined stickleback, which is still swimming uh, in the coastal waters in our oceans. Most lakes contain just a single species of uh, three-spined stickleback. It might look something like this. Here's Cranby Lake on uh, Texada Island north of um, Vancouver, which has um, one stickleback species. And to understand how, um, how they got there, we have to remember that it was only 10 to 12,000 years ago that the world where I live looked like this where my office currently sits, um, ice was about one and a half kilometers thick. And as the ice melted and um, uh, receded from the, the coast, the weight of the ice had been so great that the coastal lands then rebounded, and as it did so, bays became lagoons, became lakes, and the marine stickleback colonized. And I'm illustrating this. In a, in, a, in a cartoon to give you a picture. So here the ice is sort of receding, and now we'll get a side view of the ice melting and, and, and receding, and the weight of the ice now being removed, the, the land, which had been squashed by the weight of the ice, sort of rebounded, and as it did so, these lakes formed, and they were colonized by three-spined stickleback. And these are the populations that I um, investigate. What really drew my attention to this system was that there are some lakes that contain two species of three-spine stickleback. Uh, we call them the benthic and the limnetic. Even to this day, Carol Linnaeus would roll in his grave because we haven't described them formally with Latin binomial. And uh, what interested me about the stickleback was that they had some similarities to the Galapagos system, namely we closely related species uh, living in the same environment and ecologically very different from one another. So the limnetic species is out in the open water zone feeding on zooplankton, and the benthic species tends to be associated with the inshore environments where it feeds on um, larger invertebrates. And I've always been interested in the question, and was when I began this work, here again, closely related species, ecologically 
very different from one another. Is this a coincidence or is there some connection between the evolution of ecological differences and the origin of species? Well, that question goes all the way back to Darwin in this magnificent book that changed everything. And here on the front page, he declares that the problem of the origin of species is the mystery of mysteries. And Darwin, of course, proposed this great hypothesis, which is that new species originate by means of natural selection. And uh, most of this book is about adaptation rather than the origin of species. And besides that, uh, it's also the case that our understanding of what a species actually is has changed a lot since Darwin's day. And that is, as I mentioned, the essential feature of new species is the evolution of reproductive isolation. And it has remained until much more recently a question whether natural selection is responsible for the evolution of that. Now, what is natural selection? Well, I'm going to tell you that you already know. And that's because you all had ringside seats to the events that have happened over the last two to three years, namely this pernicious virus called COVID. And what this graph shows for uh, Sweden is a diagram of the, the prevalence, the, the um, preponderance of individual strains of COVID at different points in time. So each color represents a different strain. And you, know, you can see which ones are Omicron and which ones are Alpha and, and, and Beta and Delta. <coughs> and, and what's um, remarkable about this is that in fairly rapid order, one strain of virus replaced another, and then another, and another. And uh, this is natural selection. Each new variant that came to predominate and replace earlier variants did so, uh, not by chance, but because they were better adapted. They were better adapted to living on us. They were better at uh, evading our immune system, and they were better at being transmitted from one person to another. So that's adaptation. That's natural selection, the differential success of some strains over others. This is very much like what natural selection is like in mammals and birds and fish, except that um, for the most part, variants of, um, variants of COVID uh, replace one another in their entirety. They're not sexual in the same way. And so a variant consists of all of the genes strung together of a, uh, of a virus. Whereas in sexual species like mammals and fish and birds, the variants occur at the gene level. And it's individual genes that variants are replacing one another rather than the entire genome as in the case of COVID. But the process is the same. So the question of trying to understand how new species form um, is not necessarily an intuitive one because, uh, and, and this is something that Darwin also sort of wrote and questioned about, how is it possible for individuals of a species to evolve characteristics that make it difficult for them to mate with other individuals in the, in the, in the population? How can natural selection favor uh, the production of offspring that are less fit, that, 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 are, that have reduced fertility and reduced survival. And the answer we now know is that it, it doesn't. Natural selection doesn't favor any of these things, at least not directly, but rather reproductive isolation evolves incidentally. It's a byproduct of the ordinary process of genetic changes in population. And so speciation happens by natural selection. It's through the evolution of changes that don't directly uh, lead to the origin of species, but rather indirectly bring them about incidentally. And um, Darwin didn't know anything about genes, but if he did, I believe that this would be his picture of how something like reduced hybrid fitness or uh, a reduced tendency to um, interbreed would, would evolve. 
So to imagine how this occurs in a simple genetic model, imagine two genes in an organism, uh, A and B, Alice and Bob. And uh, th th these genes can occur in two states, or we think of them as variants was the common term during uh, the time of COVID. And uh, in one population, in a, in a new environment, say, that it has recently colonized, a mutation occurs, um, big A, at the A locus. And um, because it's advantageous in that environment, it adapts that population better to its environment. Big A eventually replaces little A. It does so by a process of natural selection. And then uh, subsequently in time, a second mutation occurs at another gene called B, and um, big B eventually place, uh, replaces B, a uh, small, uh, small B, uh, just as A replaced, big A replaced small A, producing genetic change in a population. This is ordinary adaptation. And now what I'm showing is a second population that stay remaining in the ancestral environment and doesn't undergo these changes. The idea, the central idea behind the origin of species by the evolution of reproductive isolation is that genetic changes such as these incidentally uh, cause the individuals to mate less well with one another, perhaps not even to recognize one another as belonging to the same species because these changes, they may involve size and shape and color. So mating frequency is reduced and it's reduced incidentally. Or alternatively, um, there may be incompatibilities. The hybrid may malfunction, and this would result by some sort of incompatibility between the big B gene and the little a gene, which in the history of this diversions have never before occurred, but are now present for the first time in a, in a hybrid. And if they can't talk to one another, then the hybrid may malfunction. And so hybrids um, become less fit. And this has sort of become the model how we, we now understand um, the origin of species by natural selection as possibly working. But it's one thing to, to draw this graph and say, I think we understand it. But it's quite another to say, well, do real species actually evolve in this way? And how would we know? And um, our work on the stickleback has attempted to figure out the, the ways in which we could test the role of natural selection in the evolution of these um, behavioral and um, genetic incompatibilities. So we did some fairly simple transplant experiments to show that these two species, which prefer to feed in different environments, um, actually are far better at feeding in the environment of that they prefer than in the alternate environment. Each of them has approximately a twofold advantage. And I like to show this slide because it reveals one of the fantastic features about uh, stickleback is by virtue of their size and abundance, it is possible to do transplant experiments. Of course, that would be much more difficult in other fishes, certainly, and, and nearly impossible in birds. But the most amazing thing about this uh, system, in my mind, is that evolution has repeated itself. And that is, there are a number of lakes that have been discovered along the coast that contain pairs of three-spine stickleback. And the, um, uh, the genetic data suggests that they have separate origins. It's not the case that a limnetic form evolved in one lake and then swam to all the others, or a benthic form evolved in one lake and swam to all the others, but rather pairs have evolved over and over again. Under similar environmental conditions, limnetic species and benthic species have evolved and precipitated, uh, it now seems, by uh, some lakes having been colonized twice from the sea rather than uh, just once. Now, the evolution of similar forms, a benthic type feeding on zooplankton, a limnetic type feeding, uh, sorry, a limnetic type feeding on zooplankton, a benthic type feeding on larger invertebrates, uh, finding the, the similar evolution of size and shape and behavioral characteristics is the, it's the signature of natural selection. But does this also 
um, apply to reproductive isolation? Has, evolutionary, has evolution repeated itself to the extent that reproductive isolation itself has evolved again and again? And so some of the work that we did attempted to test this. So we took a benthic from one lake, a benthic female from one lake, and um, a benthic male from another lake, placed them together in a tank, meeting for the first time their lineages for the first time in history, and asking, will they mate? And the answer is uh, yes, if they're both uh, of the benthic form. Um, then they will uh, interbreed with one another in the laboratory. And the same is true if we take a, a limnetic male from one lake and a limnetic a female from another lake and place them in a tank. But if we place a limnetic male from one lake and a benthic male from another lake into the same tank, they will not interbreed with a um, very high probability. And so what this means is that not only have size and shape evolved in parallel over and over again under similar environmental circumstances, but the very traits that cause the reproductive isolation have done the same. And only natural selection can do this. We have some insights as to why or how this can happen. And, and uh, uh, the answer is a, a large part of the reason for this pattern is that, that stickleback actually prefer to mate with other stickleback that look just like them, that look like themselves. And so the, the evolution of size and shape differences automatically brought about changes in mate preference. And this has happened over and over again. So because we can, and through collaborations with um, Katie Peichel and David Kingsley, and uh, we started to look more at the genes that underlie the origin of species. And um, a lot of the work that we do takes place in experimental ponds, which we've built on campus. So here's a drone's eye view of a section of the facility. We have 20 ponds in total. Um, and uh, each of them is 25 meters by 15 meters and six meters deep um, at one end. And um, I don't know if this is a... I don't think I have a pointer or a stick, but for scale, you can see there's a group of us standing there. It's uh, me and my uh, lab. And this allows us to uh, conduct experiments on stickleback and their hybrids to try to understand much better the material basis of the differences between the species and of reproductive isolation. And um, I'm not going to go into great detail here, but the work has allowed us to identify um, aspects of the evolution of the origin of species and, and, and provided us with a, is beginning to provide us with a deeper understanding of why hybrids are less fit and uh, where the genetic changes actually come from. So here's a, a quick um, summary of some of the work. So imagine... The benthic species shows the greatest number of genetic changes, and so it's our capital A, capital B form, whereas the limitic species is still more similar to the marine ancestral form and has the little a, uh, little b. What we've learned through our experiments is that some hybrids are just terrible at, um, at finding and acquiring food, and that's because the limitic species has aspects of its jaw adapted for rapid jaw opening and a long reach, which it uses to feed on evasive zooplankton. The benthic species has a, um, an apparatus in the jaw. It, it opens the jaw more slowly, but it's able to generate much more suction. <clears throat> and some hybrids, by virtue of the combinations of the genes that underlie these jaw traits, end up with you know, the top of the jaw looking like one of the species, the bottom of the jaw looking like one of the other species. And although the, whereas the benthic species is superbly good at slurping insects off, uh, 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 insect larvae off vegetation, and the limnetic is superb at, at catching zooplankton out in the open water, the hybrid with this strange combination of jaw traits is terrible at both and can do neither. The second thing that we've learned about the genes that distinguish these species is, is this. So we, uh, 
look at the benthic and the limitic species in Priest Lake, we look at the benthic and the limitic species in Paxton Lake, and we discover in many cases that the genetic differences that separate them in Priest Lake are the same as the genetic differences that separate them in Paxton Lake. So we find that in Paxton Lake, the benthic is big A, big A. And in Priest Lake, it's big A and big A again. And when we actually look at the sequence of these genes, we realize that actually they're closely related to, to one another. The, the big A in Paxton Lake is closely related to the big A in Priest Lake, much more so than big A in Priest Lake is to little a in Priest Lake. And what this means is that a mutation from little a to big A did not happen over and over again separately in each lake. But rather, the mutation was already there in the colonists that uh, arrived at the lake at the time of its formation. So the mutations are older. And they're not new mutations. The second thing that we've learned from looking at the sequence is that when we compare big A to little a, uh, we discover that um, not only has the mutation predated the origin of the lake, which formed only about 10,000 years ago, it predates it by orders of magnitude. The average age of the mutations that separate them is like two million years old. So the genetic changes are, are vastly older than the species themselves. In fact, there are no stickleback populations that are two million years old. So the genes, are, the genes that separate these species and that are used repeatedly in the evolution of species in separate lakes and the evolution of adaptations in those lakes are, um, are older than any of the populations that today carry them. How can this be? Well, we have a, a hypothesis for how these marine or how these old genes have been um, able to persist in this system and to be reused over and over again. And uh, I'll illustrate this with my final cartoon. So the ice recedes as before. And with the weight of the ice removed, uh, the land slowly rebounds and freshwater stickleback populations form. And as they uh, spend time in the lake, they become adapted to freshwater environment. And uh, this illustration is meant to indicate what happens now when the marine form, uh, many of which uh, swim to the bottom of streams uh, to reproduce, meets a freshwater adapted population. Sometimes they interbreed and produce a, a hybrid. And if this hybrid then joins the marine population, it will bring many of the freshwater alleles into the sea with it. And so I'm using these vertical stripes to indicate gene copies, which are actually um, inherited from the well-adapted freshwater population. But through multiple uh, generations of um, sexual reproduction in the marine population, um, the freshwater genotype, the freshwater genome is gradually broken up and dispersed, and a marine population is created in which individuals might carry one, two, even three or more copies of alleles inherited from this older interbreeding event between marine and freshwater. Now the ice recedes, the marines colonize freshwater, and they bring these variants with them. Each individual may only have a few, but uh, many individuals colonize this, uh, this new lake environment. And as they adapt to this uh, new environment, those individuals that uh, have more copies of the freshwater alleles, more, more of the freshwater variants, uh, survive better, reproduce better, produce more offspring. And gradually over time, in this way, natural selection sort of reassembles the freshwater phenotype from the um, the marine ancestral form and produces a new freshwater population that is almost like uh, a previous freshwater population. And meanwhile, the ice, ice ages come and go, populations go extinct, but the mutations that they carry persist through this cyclical process. <laughs>
Well, the title of my talk is The Modern Origin of Species, and I thought the last thing I perhaps should mention is what modern origin of species is starting to look like, and, and that is we can now make our own species in the in the lab. And this has been done. Here's a, a, a paper that appeared a few years ago from a group at the University of Miss Minnesota where they uh, they took flies and basically engineered mutations big A and big B in fly lineages um, using exactly the same model that uh, I uh, illustrated earlier in my talk and uh, created populations of flies that when they interbreed uh, produce um, offspring that are dead. So uh, they cannot interbreed any longer. So this is, I guess, some new source of biodiversity, hopefully one that never gets outside. And um, it may yet be true that we can learn something about the origin of natural species by attempting to make our own in the lab. I'm not sure I can tell you one thing, and that is the, a walk in the lab is not nearly so restorative as a, a walk in the woods. And that, uh, nevertheless, it is still worth studying natural speciation. And, uh, nevertheless, it is interesting to ask whether we can learn something from this. One thing I love about working on stickleback is that there are so many versions of stickleback in different lakes to the extent that pretty much every intermediate fo form exists between the two uh, sympatric coexisting um, um, stickleback species. And this provides wonderful material for addressing the kinds of questions that I have been interested in. And um, the last thing that I wanted to, I guess, say was to um, end with a quote also from Darwin's book. I showed you the first page. This is the, the last page, and uh, many of you are familiar with this phrase. It's probably my favorite passage in all of literature. It gives me goosebumps every time I read it. And the, the, reason, the reason it does is um, in the sort of the poetry of the paragraph that Darwin wrote, he captured not just the wonder and beauty of the tangled bank, the wonders of nature, but also the idea that all of these forms, all of this extraordinary diversity is the result of fairly simple general laws. And um, there is grandeur in this view of, of, of life, that, that um, simple f physical laws can produce something so wondrous and uh, so diverse and that his ideas have been um, so fundamental in, um, I guess, guiding us to try to understand uh, what those processes actually are. So thank you very much for listening.